So we start this extension of the 300 Tang Poets and based on what you heard in, in the previous video, uh, you would suppose rightly that we would start with Li He, who is probably the, the, the most significant omission amongst uh, the poems and, and the poets in 300 Tang Poems. So we're going to start with a very short poem, a quatrain by Li He, which is called A Changu, which was his native town. And uh, we will start with this because it's short and we will also make uh, use of the occasion to give you the biographical background of this poet. So let's move on to that. So for this uh, biographical sketch I'm going to rely basically on the biography of Li He that is included in the Indiana Companion to Traditional Chinese Literature which is the work I believe of, let me see, of Michael B. Fish uh, from the University of Oregon. So what can we say about Li He? So first of all, his uh, nickname is Zhu uh, Changchi. He lived from 791 to 817, and he was a tragic romantic poet of the late Tang, well, although those dates would fit more like the middle Tang, perhaps. Um, born to a distant branch of the imperial clan, talented, and with every prospect and desire for a prominent career, he achieved no material success in his short life. It is a truism that the poets of the Tang did not measure their life's worth by their poetry. This was matter for um, posterity, but rather it was high office in the government which counted as the essential measure of one's impact on the world. Li Hei's poetry reflects frustration and bitterness, offering sharp sarcasm, irony and satire, about political matters, in giving uncompromisingly precise details in erotic contexts. For the unusual richness of his diction, his simultaneous blandness and elusiveness, in his courting of the macabre, the unlikely, unlucky image, he earned a reputation as a difficult poet to read and perhaps a dangerous one to befriend. This characterization is drawn from the events of Li Hei's life, and from the prefaces to his collected poems written by his near-contemporaries Du Mu and Li Shangjing. In his influential preface, Du Mu argues, ostensibly, that Li Hei goes to excess in his diction and loses the sense of proportion between medium and message, and that he is in fact an eccentric poet whom the reader can choose not to understand. Li Shangjing wrote a short biography in which he makes legend of the life, rendering both poet and poetry as fictional. The intent of both prefaces is to diffuse the poetry, to present it as safe to enjoy and preserve. It is telling that some 20 years after Li Hei's death, his life and work were still dealt with circumspectly. In 809, Li Hei took the provincial examination in Luoyang. His father had died some years before. Thus, he was the hope of a family consisting of his mother, sister and younger brother. It is not supposed that he ever married. Two prominent, albeit controversial figures, Han Yu and Huang Fuxi, were his sponsors. He easily passed and went on to Chang'an to prepare for the Jinshi examination, but he was not allowed to take it. The complaint was that he would violate the taboo um, against using his father's name should he participate, since the Jin was the same as that of his father's name, Jinsu. The practice of the time was also to avoid homophones, and on this basis the charge struck. It is not known who made the case against Li He or why. In his poems on his return to Changu, the family home located in modern Honan, Li He contrasted the richness and fertility of place with the desolation of self. He had no choice but to go back to Chang'an in 811 to take the placing examination. His father had reached the fifth rank, first class, and by heredity, he was entitled to any position up to the 8th rank, 3rd class. His assorted comments from, for Huang Fuxi from the Yenho Quarter expresses on various levels his feelings during this period. Between 811 and 814, he had the title Vice Director for Ceremonials. In effect, he was an usher. The years in Chang'an are undoubtedly the period of Li Hei's many portraits of the materially rich, emotionally difficult lives of courtesans. With extraordinary diction, he captures the opulence of the high-class houses and the fragile, fugitive beauty of the women, 
often an ironic contrast to their commercial functions, as in Joys of the Night and Song of a Beauty Combing Her Hair. He continues the tradition of boudoir poetry, his works reminiscent of Li Bai's poems on women. His career stillborn, Li Hei grew increasingly conscious of his chronic illness and of the immediacy of death. This fueled his interest in the question of immortality, in images of death, and in the deceit of mythology. With a sceptical eye, he measured immortality and found it an endless series of deaths. In his Spirit Strings poems, he witnesses shamanistic performances in the style of the uh, Chudzu, but places more magic in metaphor than in medium. Like many of his contemporaries, he read Diamond Sutra, yet the extent of Buddhist influence in his poetry remains uncertain. One instance might be found in his Jasper Flower Music, a narrative poem on the legendary visit of King Mu to the Queen Mother of the West, the Shiwan Mu, which is also a retelling of the tragic romance of Emperor Xuanzong and Yang Wifei. The last couplet bears a striking resemblance to the scriptures of the annual ritual of bathing the Buddha. Evidently, religion offered him little solace, and mythology was itself a medium for allegory. For all that distinguishes Li Hei from more conventional poets, he is a product of the innovators he follows. Unusual syntax, a penchant for dissimilar, discordant parallels, the delight in ambiguity, the freedom to fill his poems with intensity, all reflect the achievements of Du Fu, the forbidding imagery of Men Jiao, and the influence of Han Yu. But the romanticism, irony, bitter wit, delight in countering traditional expectations, all belong to the poet. He saw the world in colours, fragrances, sounds, textures, and he made no pretense of doing other than interpreting his experiences. His landscapes often project a state of mind, where reds or flowers weep, the mist has laughing eyes, and nature is measured in human terms. Repetition, onomatopoeia, alliteration, allusion, the most extensive borrowing from the Chuzu since Shei Ling Yung, and multiple levels of meaning in individual poems, characterize Li Hei's poetry. And given his fondness for narratives, his best efforts tend to be all style verse. Li Hei spent his last year seeking a position outside the court on the staff of a general. Unsuccessful, he returned home in 817, quite ill, and died. His collected surviving poems total about 240. Legend has it that a spiteful cousin got hold of the collection and threw a large part of it into a privy. Such was Li Hei's luck in life and legend. So here you have the biography of this person. As you can see, he was rather unsuccessful as a scholar official, which was a big trauma for all of the um, poets in this anthology, especially the ones that like uh, Meng Haoran, Li He, um, Du Fu, either did not manage to pass the examinations, or if they did pass the examinations, never managed to reach uh, any position of relevance or significance. Meng Yao, for example. <coughs> So Li He was perceived quite early on, as you've, as, as you've heard, as, as, as an unconventional poet. And, and that's related to his nickname, uh, the ghost of poetry or the demon of poetry. So he was considered, you know, a bit unlucky, a bit dangerous. And uh, I suppose that accounts for his exclusion. He's, 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 and he's also his unconventionality uh, and, and lack of decorum probably from a scholar official's perspective. Uh, all of those things probably account for his lack of uh, appreciation. Anyway, let's uh, move on today to a short quatrain, which is this one called A Chang Hu Reading to My Man Pa. And this is a translation by Burton Watson in his um, collection of, of the lyrics of uh, early medieval Chinese poetry. And, uh, well, as we mentioned before, he was from Changu. This poem was allegedly written shortly before his death. Uh, the defeated Li He has returned to his home village. He is sick and like to die. And he's writing this poem to his retainer, this, this Mai Man Pa, who, in spite of the poverty, the misery, the failures, remains steadfast and loyal to him. And uh, this is the first poem. And this is followed by another poem, which we might be reading uh, in, in in a few in a few days, which is the, the alleged answer of my man Pa, although you know it was written by 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 Li He himself. So what's the topic of this uh, poem? This poem is depicting a night at Changu, and uh, it's not too descriptive. It's a quatrain, so it's pretty pretty short. So it uh, it depicts the physical decline 
of the poet of Levi, of his languishing in a long night of sickness. And uh, at the same time, it's also about loyalty. It's uh, the gratitude of Levi at uh, this my man past still being with him in spite of illness and adversity. There might be a, a self-referential irony, you know, in also in, in the poem, the poet is a little bit making fun of himself as well. Yeah, uh, especially in the third line with that description of a broken winged wanderer. <coughs> so, yeah, I would say those are the main themes of the this quatrain. And uh, as, as usual, the first couplet uh, generally describes the background, the nights, it gives us the time. And uh, it gives us the place. Well, the place is given in the title, but uh, it also gives us a little bit of what's happening in this night, in this wakeful night, presumably. And the second couplet moves on into a more subjective line. As it, it feels as a direct, um, a direct uh, um, voice of the poet speaking to this friend of his, to this retainer friend, thanking him for his services. So let's take a look. First couplet. Echo of insects where the lamplight thins, the cold night heavy with medicine fumes. So we are in a night, and we're, it's not stated explicitly, but it's a, a wakefulness at night poem. But here the wakefulness is not due to uh, love sickness or missing a friend. It's probably due to illness, as the second line clearly seems to illustrate. The first line gives us the sensory impressions, which are two. There's, there's an oral or sound impression, and then there is a, a light, or, or rather a lack of light impression. So in this place at Changu, the first thing we get is a sound. Insects echo in the night. So um, this is too big perhaps to tell us the season. Presumably it could be autumn, which is when the insects make the loudest noise. The late summer, autumn. So there's an echo of insects where the lamplight thins. So we are in a, a night scene that is, well, night has not been mentioned yet, but if there is a lamplight, probably it's because it's dark. So we have a lamplight giving some light. Where the lamplight stops illuminating, there we hear the echo of the insects coming from the outside. So where light disappears, sound reigns supreme. And we have this background music of insects. And probably this is meant to be a, a, an ominous type of sound as insects, uh, the in sound of insects at night is generally equated, especially in late autumn, with their crying because of their expecting their imminent death in with the colds of winter. Also the lamplight thinning you know, can act as a as a very indirect metaphor for the weakening of of the poet's own physical body, his vessel, his light is also dimming. Second line, the cold night, heavy with medicine fumes. So the night is cold, so not a pleasant uh, summer night, in which one stays awake to enjoy the coolness. No, it's cold. And that cold, again, is probably metaphorical. And also heavy with medicine fumes. So, so, so the poet, the poetic persona is ill. He's ingesting medicine or he, aromas or drinks. And his bedroom at night, with him awake, is, you know, really heavy with medicine fumes because he's taking medicine not to die. He's sick. So that's the background, as we say. Second couplet, because you pity a broken-winged wanderer, through bitterest toil you follow me still. So as we said, the, the, the second couplet seems like a direct uh, imprecation of, or, or a direct conversation, rather, with a, with this my man pa. A grateful uh, exchange, like saying, like saying, you pity me. I'm a broken-winged wanderer. Even though he's at his home, uh, Li, ba, Li, Li He has been a wanderer. You know, he was has been going to the capital and probably to other places trying to get, uh, to pass the examinations and to get a position in office. But uh, now he is broken-winged because he's sick and he's unsuccessful. So he's grateful at least that Pa pities him, and through all this pain and suffering, through all this failure, poverty, hunger, he still follows, he's still loyal to mm, Li He. And uh, this is it. So, pretty short quatrain, slightly mm, touching in, you know, in the depictions of the frustrations, sufferings, but the slight consolation that loyalty still produces on a sick man, 
on his sick bed on a cold and melancholy.